Hey, I'm just gonna quickly run through a few of the basics of the spectrum analyzer, hopefully answer a whole bunch of questions and maybe give you some neat tips and tricks for uh, you know getting the most out of it. So I'm running this in demo mode at the moment. Uh, this is particularly useful if you just wanna try out um, the instrument without actually having a Moku lab. So you can run this on just an iPad. You don't need any instrument um, or any devices connected to a network. So basically what we've got here are just two input channels um, being simulated. The red one, the input one signal is just a signal that is oscillating between two frequencies very slowly. And then the second channel, uh, the blue one here is just appears to be a signal at 150 megahertz uh, with two sidebands on it. So what we'll do is get started going around all the different features. So up the top left, we have this little uh, main menu button. This allows you to you know go through and select different devices, select instruments, save and recall settings. This is cool. So if you wanted to, you know, for example, uh, so what I'll do here is I'll get some some different settings applied. And then what I can do here is save that current state. What I could then do is go back to whatever I had it at like this. And then if I want to go back to that load safe state, then it'll actually bring me back to that exact uh, configuration. And that can be handy if you want to quickly snap back to a, a very specific or, you know, predetermined instrument configuration. Uh, you can also access files. So this is useful if you've saved a whole bunch of data and you want to basically manage it all. And then you've also got things like changing light mode. So if you work in a dark lab, this is, you know, a lifesaver because you won't go blind. Um, but, you know, most of the time people just want to use it on light mode because it looks pretty cool. And also things like external 10 megahertz reference clock. So this is important because when if you connect an external 10 megahertz reference to Merculab, it'll automatically detect that. It'll phase lock to that reference. But if you didn't want it to do that for any reason, you can force it to use the internal clock. The next icon right at the top is a little uh, cloud symbol. So clicking on that, this is uh, brings up a, the ability to save data to CSV or MATLAB files, depending on what you want to do. We can save the settings. Uh, we can save a screenshot if we want. We could change the name of the file uh, to whatever, something imaginative. And then the other thing we can do is select the destination. So, you know, you get a SD card with Moku Lab, so you can save it to that. But, you know, a lot of people actually save to Dropbox or alternatively, um, it's becoming increasingly popular to save to My Files because then you can uh, basically just store all the data locally on your iCloud account um, through the iPad's onboard storage. So to resume a measurement, you'll notice that there's a little play button down the bottom here that is, uh, you know, sort of drawing our attention towards it. It's because in order to resume the measurement, we have to click it. And so we might as well explain this. So if you wanted to pause a trace for any reason to take a measurement, then you just hit the pause button and then resume. All right, so the next icon that is worth uh, noting is the hide and show the uh, settings panel icon. So this is this one up the top right here. So if you didn't want to see all the settings, you can just hide it. This gives you maximum uh, you know, screen real estate for looking at your traces. Um, to reveal it, you basically just tap it. And what it does is it brings up this little you know, measurements panel with three different tabs. Uh, the first tab is basically how you set up the each of the different inputs. So we can select things like voltage scale, uh, the reference level. Um, these are generally actually that you know the scale and the ref level are um, most easily configured using gestures. So you'll notice that I can pinch and zoom, and I can pan around, and I can pinch sideways to change the uh, the span and but the other thing you can do is if you put two fingers on the screen and then move up, it'll zoom all the way out. And if you pull them down, it'll zoom in. So that's a, that's a, a nice quick gesture um, for very quickly, you know, changing the, the scale and, and span. Uh, you can adjust the input coupling from AC and DC. If you've got AC coupling engaged, then it just basically high pass filters above 90 Hertz. Um, that's useful if you, you know, basically want to reject a whole bunch of, of DC noise. Uh, you can select between 50 ohm and uh, 1 mega ohm impedance. So depending on what kind of system is being interrogated, 
you want to set the impedance appropriately. And then the final option here is the attenuation. So uh, it, you can't see it in demo mode, but generally, you know, if you've got a very high amplitude signal, then you want to run on 20 dB attenuation to make sure that you don't saturate the, the input analog to digital converters. So we can turn channels off, we can turn them on just with these slide switches. Um, we can also look at a math channel, which is kind of cool. So I could do, for example, a max hold. And what this is cool for is that it'll actually allow me to very quickly measure, you know, things like the, the modulation depth of this, whatever this, you know, signal or channel one's doing. So, you know, it looks like it's about 20 megahertz. Um, the other thing that you'll notice down at the bottom is that you can change the units in which you view data. So, you know, we can look at it in a linear scale, so volts. Um, and you'll notice that the noise is, is very low in this, in this view, but most of the time you're actually interested in these small features. So you look at it on a logarithmic scale in dBm, uh, but you can also view these traces in either in units of power or power spectral density. And so the power spectral density is, um, is useful because it basically normalizes the power to the resolution bandwidth, which I'll get to in a second. So in the frequency menu, you've got settings such as the start frequency and the stop frequency, that dictates the span. So you'll notice down the bottom here, I've got 35 megahertz. Well, I can make that, you know, let's just say 50 megahertz and I can make this one, I don't know, let's say 180 megahertz. And this is a really, really quick way of, of just adjusting the span. But again, the other way you can do it is just using pinch gestures. It's really like the, the nicest thing about Moku Labs interface is that you know, you don't have to mess around with knobs or buttons or anything. Um, in contrast, for example, to an electronic spectrum analyzer by Keysight or HP or Agilent, you know, in order to change the span and, you know, the, the center frequencies and all this, you have to go through menus and turn knobs and, you know, it's quite a difficult process. Um, and, you know, especially it's a, it's a very time consuming process a lot of the time as well. The next thing that you can select here is resolution bandwidth. So, we have three modes here. One is auto, in which case we just figure out a nice setting for you. You can manually set it. So for example, if I wanted to set this to a two megahertz resolution bandwidth, then uh, I can do that. But then there's also a minimum setting. So if I want to uh, basically just have the, the maximum resolution possible given the current conditions, uh, for example, the span and all this, then um, I can just set it on min and, it, you know, I can't, I can't, for example, at this, in this mode, set it to one hertz because the minimum possible resolution bandwidth is calculated to be about 123.2 kilohertz. But if I were to zoom in, you'll notice that that number is now changing. So as I, as I reduce the span, so for example, if you're looking at signals at low frequencies, you'll be able to pick out more fine details because you'll be able to get a much tighter uh, resolution on on your spectrum so I'm just going to zoom all the way out and so that was an interesting thing I didn't know about that but um, turns out that that central peak at 150 megahertz actually has some structure so what a nice little surprise so the other thing that we can do is change the windowing so I'll just go back to this so you can select from you know four options one is no windowing so this is you you could expect quite a lot of Spectral leakage in this. Um, you can select the Hanning window, Blackman Harris flat top. You know, it depends on, on what you're actually trying to measure, but you know, most of the time Blackman Harris is a is a pretty versatile window. This is important just for basically making sure that what you're actually seeing in the spectrum is signal and not just an artifact from you know the uh, the hybrid uh, super heterodyned FFT algorithm that we use. Uh, you got a video filter. Really not sure what the go with that is. Um, I, I don't personally ever use it, but I imagine, you know, it's just a nice way of, of smoothing, out, smoothing out different features. Uh, averaging is very useful. So if I turn that up, you'll notice that the noise on the, on the bottom here is, you know, basically just sort of melts into this single line, whereas if I turn it off, it's quite bubbly and, and uh, you know, dynamic. So averaging is really, really handy if you, if you want to, you know, uh, essentially reduce the noise and maximize, um, you know, the clarity of the signal that you're observing. And then persistence is cool because, again, it allows you to see what 
a signal is doing over a um, you know different periods of time. So if I set this to three seconds, then you know it gives you a very quick reference as to how that signal is changing over different time scales. So if I go to one second, for example, I can see that you know this this peak is you know moving at maybe you know a few hundred millihertz or something like that. All right, the final one is uh, also a really neat feature of Mercury Lab Spectrum Analyzer. So we have this ability to synthesize waveforms at the same time that we're measuring them. So, you know, I could, at the same time that I'm, you know, measuring, you know, signals on the inputs, I can generate different tones. So I could generate one at, you know, anywhere from basically DC up to 250 megahertz. Um, and I'll make this one, one millihertz. I can split the amplitude. It's nice because the interface is basically designed to, you know, try and make things as easy as possible. You can select units, um, yeah, it's it's pretty great actually. So, you know, this swipe to adjust thing, you just slide your finger around it and what it'll do is just update that value. Or as you saw before, just type the value in directly. All right, sweet. So now that that's done, we can have a look at some other stuff. So you may have noticed earlier that I dragged some cursors into the measurement window. Um, you know, Moku Labs user interface makes this uh, trivial because you just tap this icon here and you can add a power cursor. If I tap the blue trace and add a power cursor, it'll add a different one there. Um, I can add a frequency cursor, and this is obviously common to both of the of the traces here. So what I'll do is I'll just set that one. I might set that one to 150 megahertz. And what I might do actually is we'll use this one because it's kind of cool. What I'm going to do is set the minimum resolution there. I'm going to turn averaging up a little bit. And what we're going to do is remove that red one and I'm going to set this label to track the maximum and so what that'll do is that that cursor will now basically always follow the maximum peak um, I'm going to also show you how to very quickly add so you can just tap the icon and then just drag um, you know add power cursor but the other way is just hold that little icon and then drag up which is pretty sweet and so what I'm interested in here is two things so what I might do is set this as a reference and now what it's showing me is that my signal at this 150 megahertz is 49.5 you know, or so dBm per root hertz so in power it's about 95 um, oh, that's wrong it's about 50 dB um, which is awesome it's pretty good so that's one way of measuring signal to noise for example um, but the other thing that you can do, which is kind of cool, so if I turn averaging down, what I'm going to do is go back to auto, I might turn averaging up, no, I can't do that. I'm just going to quickly remove that, that one there. I'm going to leave this cursor to track the maximum peak of the second channel. But, you know, what I might be interested in, um, for example, is, you know, tracking or logging the frequency of whatever this, you know, this, this red tone is. And so... One of the things I can do here is if I tap this icon down the bottom right, it'll bring a marker into view like this. So what I can do with that marker is just say, well, on red channel, so on channel one, track the peak. And what it'll do is lock to that peak. And you see it's got a label here. That label is uh, marker A. And what we are going to do is if we tap this, and I tap this little measurement here, so this is currently tracking the peak level, if I say I want to track a marker and not a, you know, necessarily one of the channels, um, then what I can do is say, show me all the different markers that are available. I've got one marker called A, and I want to measure its frequency. And so you can see here that I've got now this measurement down the bottom of what that frequency is actually doing um, you know, right now, which is pretty handy. So I can drag a cursor onto the blue one as well. So I just drag it up there, and I could say, you know, just track the maximum. Um, or in track peak, I can drag it down to one of these peaks as well and it'll track that, which is, is often kind of handy. Um, so one thing, for example, that we might want to do is drag this cursor up here. And then we might say, give me the, the marker A and then give me marker B. Uh, we'll do that, there we go, sweet. And so now I've basically got two you know, real-time measurements of, of the power of the fundamental tone there at 150 megahertz, as well as this sideband at 155, which appears to be 
uh, moving up and down, which is all right. Sweet. So what else is there that's awesome about this? So yeah, this is this is pretty cool stuff here. So you know, if you wanted to measure things like total harmonic distortion, then you could do that. Um, 3dB width, which is handy. Um, uh, you know, signal to noise ratio is another handy measurement to have around. So what we might do is if I remove all markers, drag one up here, and then let's say on marker A, I want to measure signal to noise then it's going to come along and actually, you know, give me the best uh, estimate as to what that is. And so I'll quickly have a look here and see what the measurement is. And it's pretty close. So if I did it with cursors, it appears to be, if I set, so what I've done here is actually set this bottom one as a reference. Um, and then this one at the top is tracking the maximum. And so the, the measured SNR here based on that reference is 38.85 and but the actual cursor measurement here is sort of figuring out to be about 39.5 and it's doing a calculation of the actual noise in this span here. So that's pretty, pretty clever. Uh, also a very handy tool to have. Cool, so I think that's about it. The last thing that's you know somewhat worth looking at uh, is, if I turn averaging off, turn that back to manual, we'll zoom right in on this, this guy that's moving around here and what I'll do is I'll quickly just remove that. I'll get rid of all my cursors. And what I want to do is drag a marker up onto this and trace it. So what I'm going to do is add the measurement for that marker A. I'm going to track its frequency. And then I want to show a trend of it. And you'll see that what's happening in this graph is it's just showing me the trend of what that particular measurement is doing. Um, for example, if I were to add another marker here and I wanted to look at uh, the frequency of the peak, it should, in theory, give me the same thing. But what this is doing is actually not looking at a marker, it's just looking at the data and trying to figure out what the, the peak frequency is. So if there were multiple peaks on this spectrum, this marker here would just be giving me the frequency of whatever the largest one was. But I can also do SNR, I can look at noise level. Um, but you know what I'm also interested in, for example, is looking at something like the power, and that should remain relatively constant. So now we've got a dashed line that appears down here on the trends window, and that is just gonna show me that the power in that uh, particular tone is not changing over time, but its frequency is. All right, so that's cool. And then I suppose the last neat thing to, to look at is, if I zoom out like this, is if I hold down on the traces, I can put in waterfall mu. And so what this actually does is brings up what is called a spectrogram. And this is essentially the spectrum over time. And this can be a really, really cool way of visualizing, you know, time varying um, features in your, um, in your signals. So we can definitely see that, you know, oscillatory behavior of that signal on channel one, but you know, the signal on Channel two, the blue one here is not really doing too much. Although if we zoom in, you can kind of see some sinusoidal modulation on the amplitude of those sidebands. And so you can see that this waterfall view just gives you a really intuitive uh, snapshot into the time varying characteristics of whatever signals you're viewing, um, which is again, extremely handy and also kind of cool to look at. So I guess there's that as well. So to exit out of this, oh, just quickly, you can actually um, still save data from here. Um, but to exit, you just click the X button and then we are done. And then of course, if we want to get back out, switch our instruments or just go back to the main menu, just hit this and then, and then off we go. Sweet.